Welcome to the first Tartarus devlog. In this video, I'll cover the project's core libraries that'll be used for graphics and I.O., and then talk about the underlying entity component system architecture I'm developing from scratch. Lastly, I'll demonstrate a working example of all these topics by creating an entity, assigning components, and using a rendering system to draw the entity to the screen. In the Zeroth Tartarus devlog, I provided some project background and aspirations for how it might be applied in the future. If you're wondering what Tartarus is and the purpose of these devlogs, check out that video. However, since I've already laid the groundwork, I'm excited to move on to the first video where I get to discuss features that I'm actively developing. First up, graphics is a fundamental aspect of any game engine, and actually modern computers in general. But focusing exclusively on game engines, their whole purpose is to create something like a world or an environment and populate it with various objects and entities with which the user can interact. That'd be next to impossible without visuals. The need to display visual information is so important that universal libraries exist so that you and I can create graphical objects that can be displayed on all platforms. One of these libraries is called OpenGL, which stands for Open Graphics Library. Now I'm not going to go into detail about the library or its history, you can find a link to the OpenGL website in the description, but note that because it works on most platforms, OpenGL is, or was, a cornerstone computer graphics library. And I say was because, sadly, OpenGL is no longer under active development because its successor, called Vulkan, has taken its place. Vulkan succeeded OpenGL in 2018 and offers significantly more advanced functionality intended to fix some of the primary issues and weaknesses of OpenGL. Therefore, OpenGL progressed up to version 4.6, but was discontinued. Now, if you're like me, that might induce a little panic. What do you mean OpenGL is deprecated? Then why use it? Why not switch to Vulkan? Well, there are actually a couple good reasons that I'm not planning to switch to Vulkan anytime soon. First and foremost, I don't have a computer that supports it. it. Turns out that your computer hardware, namely your graphics card, has to be designed to handle the different versions of OpenGL and Vulkan. And unfortunately, my computer's a bit older and only supports up to OpenGL 3.3. Secondly, I'm actually pretty new to what's called modern OpenGL, and I think there's probably a case to be made that understanding how to use OpenGL will provide a good starting point for learning more sophisticated graphics libraries like Vulkan later on. Not to mention, for my purposes, it won't limit me in any major way, so it makes sense to forego the significantly more complex interface and rules of Vulkan, and just stick with what works. Lastly, I intend to design Tartarus to be modular, so my hope is that I'll one day be able to incorporate OpenGL and Vulkan under the hood, so that both older and newer computers can run Tartarus programs without a hiccup. So, as I said, I'll be using OpenGL 3.3 for now. But note that OpenGL only solves the problem of how to draw stuff using your graphics card. It does not solve the problem of how to draw stuff on the screen. To do that, you actually need to interface with the operating system, create a window, and tell OpenGL to draw stuff in that window. Time for another external library that handles input-output, or I.O. There are a few popular I.O. libraries out there, including SFML and SDL, but Charters will be based on what's called GLFW. GLFW is an extremely lightweight cross-platform library that interfaces with the operating system to create windows for OpenGL drawing, receive mouse and keyboard input, and a few other things. This is actually a rather poor analogy, so take it with a grain of salt, but think of OpenGL as the paintbrush and GLFW as the canvas. Without the paintbrush, you have a boring canvas, and without the canvas, you can't even begin painting. Now that we've covered the core libraries, let's start discussing one of the most important and complex aspects of the engine, the Entity Component System Architecture, which I'll just refer to as ECS for short. An ECS is essentially a very clean and modular way of organizing all the pieces that comprise a video game. Let me provide a very tangible example that shows how and why ECS is so useful in game development. Let's start with a player class that's often used to explain ECS. Suppose I'm making a game and want to instantiate a player that has health, can move around, and is able to attack. To represent those features, I might give the player a health bar, a position, a velocity, and a weapon. Now suppose I want to create an enemy that can also attack, but the enemy is stationary, like an evil tree that can wield an axe. Obviously, I want the enemy to have a health bar, a position, and a weapon, but if the enemy is stationary, a velocity doesn't really make sense. So I create a new class for evil tree, 
and essentially duplicate most of the code from the player class. Now, suppose I want to create a benign character that doesn't attack anything, like a little bunny rabbit. It should have a health bar, a position, and a velocity, but no weapon. So I create a new class for bunny rabbit, once again duplicating a lot of the same code. As you can see in these three cases, each time I want to create a new type of creature, I have to make a new class that copies and redefines the code originally developed for player. Furthermore, although it's not obvious at face value, any time I might want to work with the health or maybe the position of any of these creatures, I end up having to load into computer memory all this other data as well. And it turns out that that's really inefficient. For example, with the evil tree, I know that the tree's stationary and will never move from its original position. But any time I need to change the tree's health, I inevitably have to load the position data into memory. So it wastes a lot of computation. This is where ECS comes to the rescue. Instead of making a new class for each creature that contains their necessary features, what if the creatures were defined by the features they reference? In that paradigm, each creature would be this abstract concept called an entity, and each feature would be a component of that entity. In this case, I could simply create three separate entities. The first, which represents the player, would reference a health bar, position, velocity, and weapon. The second entity, which represents the evil tree, would reference a health bar, position, and weapon, and so on. Now I'm free to create a new entity using any combination of these original components, and I don't have to write any new code. For example, say I wanted to add ghosts to the game that don't really do anything other than float around. Those ghosts would need a position and velocity, and I can easily create that. Maybe another entity that's not a creature, like a boulder, could be created using position and a new component called weight. It becomes trivial to create new entities and new components to generate even more entities. Because the entities are no longer bounded by or to their components, I'm free to swap or even remove components as necessary. Maybe when evil trees die, they become ghosts. It's easy to remove the health bar and weapon and add a velocity to this entity to convert it from an evil tree to a ghost. The other huge advantage with this approach is that now, anytime I want to work with a specific component, I can iterate over the list for all entities at the same time. For example, if I need to update the health of all game objects before the next frame of the video, I can quickly iterate over each health bar without needing or even caring about the velocities, positions, or other components. Zooming out a bit, the things that iterate over the components belonging to the entities are called systems. Systems are programmed to iterate over specific components or groups of components. So you might, for example, have a battle system that iterates over weapons and health, a physics system that iterates over position and velocity, and so on. Hence, an ECS is comprised of entities, which are just IDs, components which those IDs reference, and systems which iterate over those components. And that's the entity component system architecture in a nutshell. Now, ECS is a massive topic, and I'm certainly not doing it justice with my chatter and weak example cases. So if you're interested in learning more, you can find a few resources in the description to get you started. Suffice it to say for now that ECS is extremely important for modular game development. In fact, that's why I spent the first month or so of Tartarus's development planning and writing the ECS architecture. Since I had no previous experience with developing an ECS, I'll readily admit it was extremely challenging and one of the more difficult things I've developed. It's still not complete and likely contains several bugs, but it's at least a very good start. And now, I'd like to demonstrate it for you. I'm going to create an entity which, as I said earlier, is just an ID. I'm going to assign it a vertices component to give it a shape, and then I'll use the render system to render this entity to the screen. The render system simply operates on the vertices component to draw each vertex to the screen. Now, when I execute this program, we see this spectacularly underwhelming triangle. At first glance, you're probably a little disappointed, maybe even feeling like I deceived you, but don't be distracted by the fact that all this was accomplished using ECS. That means that if I want to attach a new component, say position to this triangle, I can easily do that. Then I could create a movement system that would update the triangle's position. So in as little as 100 or possibly even 50 lines of code, I could add a completely new dimension to the way this current program runs, and from there, be able to trivially assign movement to any entity. And that's the flexibility I'll rely on going forward to explore some of the really interesting topics I mentioned in Devlog Zero. Pun semi-intended, this ECS is a core component of the game engine because it'll allow me to create a whole slew of distinct entities, like characters, buttons, menus, items, and so on, 
without needing to write tons of new code. In principle, there's no limit to the types of entities that can be created using ECS, and I'm hopeful that freedom will allow me to show you some pretty cool stuff. Thanks for watching. As you can see, I'm still getting started with Tartarus and I'm making slow but steady progress. If you enjoyed this content, I'd appreciate a like and your subscription if you want to stay up to date on this devlog series. If you have any cool ideas or suggestions, please feel welcome to pass them along. And don't forget, leave a comment on what features or content you'd like to see in a future devlog video. Until next time, remember that one of the most important things in life is the time we get to spend with those closest to us. Be sure to cherish those moments.